All righty, so let's get started on uh, today's class. So this is going to be, uh, last time was your introduction to the course. This is actually going to be your introduction to uh, the topic of the psychology of learning. So uh, what we're going to do today is just cover the sort of um, fundamental things that uh, we're going to be, um, uh, we need to know uh, while we're doing this course. First and foremost, we're going to take a look at uh, why we're going to be studying basically behaviorism. So behaviorism was a dominant uh, form of psychology for a uh, few decades. It has fallen out of favor uh, in recent times, but we're going to be studying a lot of behaviorism in this course. So we're going to be uh, finding out why. And then we're going to take a look at uh, the use of animal experiments and human applications. So another thing that you'll notice as you're going through your readings for this course is you're going to read a lot about experiments involving rats, you're going to read a lot about experiments involving pigeons. And every once in a while, you're going to read about an experiment involving dogs. And then even once in a while, once or in a while, you're going to uh, learn, um, read about experiments with humans. So most of what we're going to be studying was first discovered. These principles were first um, uh, discovered using animals uh, subjects. So we're going to take a look at whether or not animal experiments can actually tell us anything about our own human behavior. But uh, to start off, why study behaviorism? So I'll give you a brief, uh, very brief history of behaviorism. Hopefully uh, you've encountered behaviorism in the general psychology course. But uh, to kind of jog your memory, this is John B. Watson. He is known as the founder of behavior behaviorism, hugely influential uh, individual in the history of psychology, came up with a lot of the ideas, the idea of the stimulus and response. Um, later on, as we're going to uh, see in this course, took his knowledge of the psychology of learning and uh, made uh, tons of money in advertising. So uh, we're going to see later on how the principles of the psychology of learning are used in advertising to influence behavior. Uh, and it all started with John B. Watson. Uh, Clark L. Hull uh, came up with the next iteration of behaviorism known as neo-behaviorism. And neo-behaviorism, if you ever get a chance to uh, check it out, uh, it is one of the most influential psychology theories ever. So uh, historians have taken a look at this influence. And during its peak time of influence, um, when a psychology theory is published, when a psychology theory goes out into the world, Oftentimes, the way to uh, the way to gauge uh, how influential it is is how many psychology papers that are published in the psychology journals that you know we have in our libraries. How many of those papers that are published in a single year are on a particular theory? And you can imagine today that you know there's going to be a small proportion in child psychology. There's going to be a small proportion in perception. There's going to be a small proportion in emotional studies in psychology. And the ones in child psychology, some of them will be doing uh, research on one theory. Some of them will be doing research on another theory. It's very spread out. It's very diverse uh, in terms of the theories that are being tested in psychology. When Clark uh, Hull came out with his neo-behaviorism theory, at one point, 70% of the papers that were published were about his neo-behaviorism theory. So people in child psychology were doing neo-behaviorism. People in perception were doing neo-behaviorism. Everybody, well, seven out of 10 people were doing neo-behaviorism. And I don't think we're ever going to get to that uh, ever again. So highly, highly influential uh, and came out of behaviorism. And then finally, we have uh, hopefully a name you'll recognize, B.F. Skinner. And uh, he did a ton of work that we're going to encounter, some of it today. And he's been identified as the most influential psychologist of the 20th century. So in the last 100 years, he is the guy in terms of uh, being influential in psychology. And a lot of his ideas, as we begin to uncover them, you're going to see them at use in our everyday culture um, because of this amount of influence. So behaviorism was all the rage uh, back in the day in the 50s and 60s. Uh, everybody was uh, doing behaviorism. It was a predominant um, school of psychological thought. However, that's not the case these days. 
behaviorism has been supplanted by cognitive psychology as the dominant approach. So most psychologists today, they use uh, information in, how is it being processed, information out approach to behavior. Uh, and that is the basic idea of cognitive psychology. And that has, uh, again, replaced behaviorism as the dominant approach to psychology. So the question is, is in the psychology of learning, why are we not studying cognitive psychology? Why are we going to predominantly look at behaviorism? And the reason has to do with not the limitations of behaviorism. So behaviorism got supplanted by cognitive psychology because there were limitations to behaviorism. There was a lot of questions that they just couldn't answer. There was a lot of behavior that they just couldn't address using behaviorism. So cognitive psychology came along and said, hey, we got all these new concepts. We got all these new ideas. Maybe we can help explain some of this behavior. And it turned out they were right. And that's why everybody ran with cognitive psychology. So there's definite limitations to behaviorism. And that's why it was abandoned. So why are we studying it? Well, it has to do not with the limitations of behaviorism, but what does it do very well? So if we were to represent psychological phenomena as this ellipse here, let's say that this ellipse represents everything we want to know about behavior and the mind. So everything about psychology. This is the entirety of the psychological knowledge that we're trying to discover when we study psychology. That's everything we want to know. Cognitive psychology is the current dominant approach because it is very good at explaining a lot of what we're kind of uh, looking for, what we want to know about psychology. So it can explain things like reading. It can explain things like um, mental imagery. It can explain things like um, uh, imagination. Some things it can't explain. So consciousness is currently outside of the realm of cognitive psychology. We do not yet know why we're conscious of our experiences. There's nothing in cognitive psychology that requires us to be aware of what's going on. So we really don't know how that works yet, and that's outside of cognitive psychology. And eventually, cognitive psychology as it is will be abandoned so that we can get to these final psychological mysteries. So that's all of psych uh, cognitive psychology. And it actually also explains things like uh, the basics of learning, um, positive reinforcement, uh, intermittent contingencies. It explains all those basic principles of learning, but that's because it's kind of subsumed behaviorism. So behaviorism has a lot of limitations. A lot of this stuff over here that's part of psychology, behaviorism is missing. But what it's not very limited in is in the psychology of learning. So all that psychology of, of learning, it's all in this ellipse. So while we wouldn't study behaviorism anymore for a complete understanding of psychology, we can study behaviorism for a very nearly complete understanding of the basics of the psychology of learning. And that's why we're gonna be looking at a lot of studies and a lot of scientists that were behaviorists. And even though it's an abandoned, um, well, not completely abandoned, but even though it's no longer the dominant approach, uh, it still has very, very, very much to say about uh, how we learn uh, and the principles of learning. All right, so that's where we're going to focus on behaviorism. And part of what came out of behaviorism was the uh, use of animals uh, in experiments. So the use of animals as models of our human experience. So the next thing we're going to take a look at is uh, the use of these animals and uh, whether or not they can be applied to our human behavior. So most learning principles that you're going to be reading were derived from research with animals. So you're going to be reading a lot about studies done with rats. You're going to be reading a lot about studies done with pigeons. And you're going to be reading a lot about studies done with dogs. And uh, those, I think, in that order are the popular animals for psychological research. So what we're going to take a look at right now is how relevant are these results to human behavior? Because there's a lot of difference 
between us and a rat, right? There's a lot of cognitive psychological differences between us and a rat. But as we're going to see, the difference in how we learn is actually very small. So for a lot of learning, the same principles that guide learning in the rat are the same principles that are guiding learning in the human being. So let's take a look at that uh, in a few instances. And we'll start off with uh, a little bit about B.F. Skinner and some of the work that he did. While some scientists engineer shiny new consumer goods for an eager public, Harvard psychologist B.F. Skinner seeks nothing less than the engineering of human nature. In experiments with subjects as simple as pigeons, Skinner declares that with the right social engineering, we can create a new breed of human being. Skinner is firmly in the behaviorist tradition pioneered by John Watson in the 1920s. Like Watson, Skinner contends that with the right tools, we can predict and control behavior. Skinner really inherited the, the mantle from Watson of behaviorism in this country, but it's kind of interesting to think about how there's a subtle difference uh, in the way they went about it. Watson, as we know, ended up becoming an advertising executive, ended up embracing the American value system as it existed. Skinner was different. Skinner was a visionary. Skinner felt that through behaviorism, he could influence the world towards a greater humanity, not meet humanity where it was, but take humanity to a new place through the principles of behaviorism. Picking up where Watson left off, Skinner wants to do the rigorous science to prove that environment is everything. Change the environment, he argues, and you can change the individual. Or in Skinner's case, the pigeon. Skinner himself was a born catcher to uh, He had, in his own early years, as a boy, for example, he developed ways of sorting ripe, I think it was cranberries, from unripe cranberries. He invented a cannon that would shoot things over his neighbor's fence. This was the kind of man he was. He was developing new ways to do everyday things in ways that were more comfortable, more efficient. During World War II, Skinner had developed a pigeon guidance device for the U.S. military. While the Russians had dogs carrying bombs, and the Swedes had seals to blow up mines, Skinner had a plan of his own. Teaching pigeons to guide missiles to an enemy target. At the time, however, the military had no missiles to guide. But Skinner's pigeon research did not go to waste. All right, before we talk about the uh, uh, pigeon research that um, Skinner was doing, just like an interesting aside to that uh, mention about the missile guidance system. So Skinner made a, uh, um, a system where you could train pigeons to guide a missile to, uh, to its target. So basically the pigeon was in the missile, and then as the missile was homing in on its target, the pigeon would peck in certain directions to tell the missile a little bit higher, a little bit lower, you know, go, go down here. And uh, they never picked it up. Uh, they never um, went through with it, partially because, uh, well, this is back in the day, uh, they would have no qualms about blowing up pigeons in the, um, uh, in the pursuit of war. But also uh, it was very, everybody I think was worried about the responsibility. So if a pigeon made a mistake, if a pigeon uh, blew up a hospital, then uh, there would be, you know, repercussions coming down. And I don't think anybody wanted to put their career in the hands of a pigeon. However, on the positive side of this, so, just don't you, so you don't think it's all dark and dreary, um, they were at a time using pigeons uh, to uh, serve as uh, rescue um, lookouts uh, when they were searching for people lost at sea. So pigeons, as it turns out, have an amazing ability. They got great visual acuity and they have amazing ability. You can teach them to detect humans in a picture. So there was a study where um, an ex uh, the experiment was set up where there would be a picture, like thousands of pictures with no humans in them. So they went out and they took pictures of the world and there was no humans in the picture. 
And then there were another thousand pictures with humans in the picture. And the pigeons were trained to just peck on the picture when there was a human and don't peck when there was no human. And the pigeons were extremely accurate, except for one picture where the pigeons kept saying, yep, there's a human, there's a human, there's a human. And the experimenters were like, no, there's no human there until they basically took out their magnifying glass and way far out in the background, there they were, that one human that every single pigeon was, uh, was finding. So they're great at finding humans. So what they would do, and I don't think they have this anymore, but uh, they would have helicopters uh, flying over areas where, you know, a, a boat went down in the sea. They would have helicopters with these little glass bottoms and this pigeon inside with little pecking detectors. And the pigeon would basically just be looking around. And as soon as it saw a human, it would start pecking in that direction. And that would be relayed to the pilot. And the pilot would be like, all right, there's somewhere over there. So they can... They can be used to save lives as well. So a lot of what we're going to be learning here in the, uh, the psychology of learning can be used for evil intentions, but uh, also can be used to uh, for uh, great good uh, and uh, wonderful outcomes. Develops a system called operant conditioning to prove that a behavior will be repeated by a subject when rewarded. Repetition leads to reinforcement. Reinforcement to changes in behavior. This hungry pigeon is moving about more or less at random. Sometimes it turns its head to the left. When it does, we reinforce that movement by giving the pigeon access to a dish of grain. Skinner then waits for it to turn further. Again, more food. Ultimately, the pigeon will turn in a complete circle, having learned that only when it turns will it be rewarded. What Skinner was able to do in very carefully controlled studies with animal models was to demonstrate that whole chains of behaviors could be built step by step so that literally you could teach a pigeon to do complicated behaviors that no one would have predicted possible. And Skinner believes that if it works for pigeons, why not people? In Skinner's mind, behavior is behavior, up and down the evolutionary scale, and it is all learned. Uh, so I just love the idea that this is like the iPad point .0, you know, point zero when it first came out. But notice that immediately when Skinner found out about these principles in, you know, in a pigeon, he said, you know what, let's, let's try it with human beings and see if it uh, actually translates uh, to human beings. And you're going to see that as we go through this semester, the majority, the vast majority of what they've learned uh, using animals applies very strongly to human beings. So uh, one thing that you'll notice as we go through, if any of you uh, play games on your smartphone, you will notice how these games are stacked with uh, uh, principles from learning to make sure that you play the game, to make sure that you return to the game, and to uh, entice you to make purchases in the game. It's all built in with these principles that they learned from studying uh, pigeons and rats. So let's wrap this up. One of the great successes is in education. People are taught to do more complicated tasks than anyone had thought possible by breaking down behavior into small steps and giving positive reinforcement along the way. The essence of Skinner's work was that we could manipulate the environment in ways that would permit us to produce any kind of behavior that we wished and we could develop individuals in ways that made every possible future um, open to them. The idea that anything is possible. All right, so that was Skinner. And as you can see, a lot of the kind of basic ideas that he came up with, the idea of you know uh, reinforcing uh, an individual, the idea of building up very complex chains of behavior um, by starting off with very simple behaviors, are all things that have been now incorporated into our culture because, again, we know that they 
they work. So think back to when you were uh, learning to read, right? Nobody put up a word and say, can you read this word? The word is phenomenon. And you're like, how am I supposed to read that? I'm in kindergarten. No, they started with small little bits. What's this letter? Oh, it's an A. Very nice. Very good. What's this letter? Oh, it's a, you know, it's a Q. Oh, excellent. So this idea of building up from smaller blocks to bigger blocks, again, was something that Skinner proved works with uh, pigeons and uh, later on was incorporated by uh, the educational systems. All right. So uh, the next thing we're going to take a look at is a setup for uh, the third video we'll look at. And this is a rat here. And we're going to see that this rat has um, just about learned how to bar press. I think this is the instance of the first bar press uh, from this rat. So you will go through a very similar experience when you train Sniffy. But uh, pressing a bar is one of the things, one of the behaviors that has been studied, uh, has been used as uh, the measure of behavior a lot um, in studies with rats. So let's check that out. All right, so the rat presses the lever and it gets a little food. It presses the lever and it gets a little food. It presses the lever and it gets a little food. And this behavior has been studied extensively to see what kind of variations can we have on this behavior. So in this case, every single time the rat is pressing the bar, uh, it gets a little food. But what's been found is that you don't have to reinforce a rat every single time. You can just reinforce them every once in a while and he'll continue to press the bar. And uh, if you do that, the bar pressing actually gets stronger. He's more likely to keep pressing that bar over and over and over and over again when the food stops. So if you only reinforce him once in a while, if you only give him food once in a while, then at some point, if you turn off the food, that rat will just keep pressing that bar for a long time before very, it uh, decides that it's had enough. So very many kind of principles in bar pressing uh, have been studied in the rat. And one of the biggest insights, uh, human insights that came from this research, uh, and it's easy to see the similarity, has to do with when humans uh, basically do the equivalent of the bar press, and that has to do with gambling. So a lot of principles that became apparent in people with gambling addiction were learned and brought to light studying rats pressing these bars because the rat pressing the bar and getting the reward of food is very much like what we're going to see here, which is humans pulling a lever or pressing a button and maybe being reinforced with, uh, with winnings. It wasn't that long ago that if you wanted to gamble, you had to travel a long way. Well, today, to shoot craps or play slots, all you have to do is get in your car. There's probably a casino in your state or right next door. As we first reported in January, there is now casino gambling in 38 states, which use the revenue from gambling to help solve their bloated budget deficits. The main attraction of these gambling halls is now the new slot machines. There are close to 850,000 of them in the United States, twice the number of ATMs. We Americans spend more money on slots than on movies, baseball, and theme parks combined. But with slots, there is the potential for a dangerous side effect, gambling addiction. And more people are addicted to slot machines than any other form of gambling. The story will continue in a moment. what slot machines used to look like, where you pull the handle and hope for three of a kind. <laughs> this is what they look like today. All right. This, we're going to talk about this uh, later on in this semester, but this is a question I'll just, I'll just pose now and try to think about it. 
you remember uh, you saw first the old timey slot machine, right? You pull the lever and there's three physical tumblers that turn around and they stop one, two, three, and then you receive your prize if they if they match. That could possibly be just because of the mechanics of how a slot machine was made. So if you want to randomize, you know, the three tumblers, maybe you have to spin them independently, maybe you have to stop them independently. I don't know, I'm not an engineer. However, I know enough about computer screens and computer programming to know that in today's newer versions of slot machines, there is no mechanical or engineering or programming reason why they have to stop one at a time. So why are there still these five, in this case, five kind of screens that are going down, tumbling by? Why are they stopping one at a time? We're going to see that the, the easy answer is that it makes the games more addictive. But what is it about that? What is the principle of learning that is driving these designers to continue to have these screens stop one at a time? So we'll, we'll see that answer in the coming weeks. Something to think about before we get there, though. The modern slots are like high-tech video games that play music and scenes from TV shows. You can play hundreds of lines at once, and instead of pulling a handle, you bet by pushing buttons, which means each bet can be completed in as little as three and a half seconds. It looks like great fun, but it can be dangerously addictive. Whether or not it's their intention, the gambling industry is designing machines that can addict people. All right, so it is their intention uh, to do that. I'll just let you know. Um, when I was a postdoc uh, at the University of uh, Nevada in uh, Reno, um, we uh, one of the areas that we did research in was color. And when you uh, when the casinos, when the um, slot machine manufacturers design their machines, they made sure they all came together and they picked a key that all of their slot machines would play their sounds in. So they did not want an array of hundreds of slot machines and they all had like dissonant, you know, discordant sounds so that it sounded horrible when you went into a slot machine room. They all got together and say, hey guys, how about this key? Make all your noises in this key and that way it all sound good when you have the whole thing jumbled together. Well, we got a call at our lab and they wanted to do the same thing for color. So they were saying, uh, they asked us, they go, you guys are color researchers. Um, can you come up with a sort of color scheme where we can pick from those colors and regardless what our slot machines look like, they won't clash with each other visually. And uh, we didn't take the research product project, but that's the kind of, I mean, they're using the science to make their games uh, much more, um, Addictive is one way to say it, much more, uh, less likely that you'll stop playing. And again, a lot of the principles that we've seen are being used in slot machines. Tons of them are being used in online gaming. So if you ever, you know, if you know a friend who back in the day uh, couldn't stop playing Angry Birds, popped it out every second that they could. Uh, a few years ago, if Candy Crush was their go-to whenever they had a couple of minutes to spare, few years ago, if they were wandering the streets playing Pokemon Go or whatever the current one is, that was all designed by the game companies to make sure that you continue to play these games. And it's all based on those rats in that Skinner box pressing that bar. And if you've ever seen the mobs of people, the videos of the mobs of people playing Pokemon Go in the middle of the night in somebody's neighborhood, you can see just how effective these uh, principles are. MIT anthropology professor Natasha Scholl has studied gambling addiction for over 15 years. She's interviewed gamblers, casino owners, and slot machine designers. Do you think that most people would even think that a machine could addict you, that a machine can do the same thing that a drug could? What addiction really has to do is with uh, the speed of rewards and uh, these machines they're packing 1,200 hands uh, per hour into play, you're being exposed, you can see that as being exposed to a higher dose. A higher dose, says Scholl, because all that speed means more bets, and that means more excitement. And no machine is better for that than the penny slot, the most popular game on the casino floor. Because the bets are small, you can place hundreds of them at a time. Another core aspect of their addictiveness is their continuous nature. 
you're not interrupted by anything. You're not waiting for the horses to run. You're not waiting for the guy next to you to choose his card to put down. There's no roulette wheel spinning. It's just you and the machine. It's a continuous flow without interruption. I found that the machines were wonderful. I love the excitement. I love the people. I love the camaraderie, the high fives when you win. It was just very exciting. Sandy Hall lives only a short drive from thousands of slot machines in Rhode Island and Connecticut. Married with two daughters, she worked in a bookstore and used to look at the casinos as an entertaining break. But eventually, she was playing slots so much, she burned through her retirement funds. My every thought and every being, if I wasn't at the casino, I was figuring out how I was going to get there. Where was I going to get the money? You know, you're, you sound like a heroin addict. It takes your soul. It takes your humanity. You come home, you drive home pounding the steering wheel. Promising yourself you're never going to go again. You're never going to do it again. And you know that you're going down, and you're going down, and you're going down. I became, from a, a nice person, I became a manipulative, deceitful, lying person. Lies just manufactured themselves. You didn't even have to think about it. Marilyn Lancelot, another slot addict, ended up embezzling over a quarter million dollars from her employer in Phoenix, Arizona. My daughters lived within... Uh, two houses away. They did not know I was stealing money or gambling until one day seven police cars drove into my yard and took me away in handcuffs. That's how they Handcuffs? Out. Yeah. This is gambling for gambling's sake. Uh, and the aim is not to win a jackpot. She's not talking about most people who go to casinos. She's All right. So we saw two cases of gambling addiction. And what we're going to see uh, also in this semester when we learn about the principles of learning is that uh, there was nothing fundamentally wrong with the mental abilities of either of those two uh, gambling addicts. So there's nothing insane about them. There's nothing crazy about them. What they ended up doing is definitely crazy. So if, when, you know, when they say, oh, my every thought was about the slot machine, how am I going to get back there? How am I going to get back there? Anybody would look at that behavior and say, that's insane. Like, I can't believe you're doing that. Embezzling a quarter of a million dollars from your employee, uh, illegal and insane, right? That's just a crazy way of behaving. But what we're going to see is that there's nothing mentally deficient or um, mentally abnormal about either of those individuals. What happened to them is that they were placed in a certain environment. They were placed in certain situations and through the mechanisms of learning, they ended up with this uh, uh, trained behavior to go to that casino, go to that slot machine, put your money in and press the button. And just like that rat, that'll keep pressing that button, even though pressing that bar, even though it's not giving it food anymore. These individuals kept pressing that button, even though their money was going and going and going. Only really talking about addicted gamblers. Are you saying that they'd rather stay in the game than win the money? And not only am I saying that, but I found instances where gamblers who won a jackpot um, then became irritated because it stopped the flow of play. Researchers at the University of Waterloo in Canada measured how players respond physiologically while they gamble and showed that the new machines can make them think they're winning even when they're not. The gambler almost always gets some money back. If he puts in a dollar, he might get back 50 cents. But the sounds and flickering lights trick his brain into thinking he came out ahead. The constant feeling of winning creates so much pleasure, says Natasha Schulte, that regular players can slip into a trance-like state, a place she calls the zone. Uh, one gambler told me that when he's in the zone, uh, he couldn't remember his children's name. You go into that trance, that zone, that box. Nobody can touch you. You have escaped from reality. No one can ask you for anything. When you sat in front of those machines, did you get in the zone? Did you have a I was having a love affair with that machine. That was my love. If anybody came near it or touched it, back off. Don't touch my machine. It was the same as a kiss from a lover. Really? It was sweet, sweet. All right, so for most of us, we don't, we don't go to that extreme. Um, but what we're going to see is that uh, the principles of learning can be applied to a wide range of human behaviors, including 
uh, love. So one of the things we're going to see is that um, dating, um, interactions, uh, what you do when you when you uh, go on a date with somebody, all of those things that we kind of take for granted are based in the principles of learning uh, in order to achieve a very uh, specific outcome, namely that the person has uh, attractive feelings uh, towards you. So we're going to see again how these basic principles can explain some very, very complex behaviors. And, um, you know, I've never known anybody that was in love uh, with their slot machines, but I have known people uh, in love with their cars. I have known people uh, in love with their phones. So uh, it's not that uh, ab um, abnormal a behavior, but definitely this is extreme. So we all do this to a certain amount, right? When we were kids, we all had a, a favorite toy or favorite blankie, uh, an inanimate object that we love. But uh, usually it's not to this extreme. But again, it's the same learning principles that uh, got her there um, that, again, work on us all. And yet not everyone is convinced the machines addict people. Listen to Howard Schaefer, the director of the Harvard Medical School Division on Addiction, the man the gambling industry loves to quote, and your position is machines are not addictive. That machines, inanimate objects, are not addictive. Machines didn't make me do it. If slot machines caused addiction, then most people who played slot machines would develop addiction, and it's the opposite. But at one point, you said slot machines were the crack cocaine of gambling. I did say and, that. And how does that square with what you're telling me today? Not everybody who uses crack cocaine becomes addicted. Yeah, but nobody's going to sit here and try to tell me crack cocaine isn't addictive. And if this is like crack cocaine, the conclusion is that it's addictive. So I, I don't come to the same conclusion because How the majority of people that have used cocaine have not developed cocaine addiction. Only a small minority have. And the same would be true with gambling. The problem is... All right, so I'm going to just mention something there because I'm sure a lot of you are looking at that and thinking, what is, how does this guy have a job? Um, so uh, after I watched this video, I remember going to, so I'm not in clinical psychology. Addiction is not my, uh, any, any one of my specialties, but I went to Dr. Hubbard and I asked him, I go, when is something addictive, right? So alcohol can be addictive because we kind of need alcohol. We can, I mean, if you're addicted to alcohol, you'll, you'll feel the need for alcohol. You feel that compulsion for alcohol, but we don't consider food addictive. And yet I have not gone very many days without food. And if I don't get food every once in a while, I'm going to start getting anxious and I'm going to start getting hangry. And, you know, I mean, it's like, we need food, we need water, we need sleep. So what's going to be classified as addictive and what's not going to be classified as addictive and when I asked Dr. Hubbard, his first, uh, his first response was, well, because, and what that meant was, there's a wide variety of, of definitions out there. There's a wide variety of people who say, oh, this is addictive. No, this is the criteria for addiction. No, 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 over here is the criteria for addiction. So that uh, researcher, that scientist, he has a very specific criteria of addiction. And one of the things that it includes is that if not everybody is getting addicted to a particular substance, then he will not classify it as addictive. So alcohol wouldn't be addictive because not everybody turns into an alcoholic after you have your first drink. Uh, cocaine, in his definition, is not an, addic an addictive substance because apparently not everybody that tries cocaine ends up with a cocaine addiction. And in that case, gambling is also not addictive according to his, uh, his definition. Now, he's one of the few people that have that definition. So, you know, don't be walking around telling your friends that cocaine is not addictive because you heard a scientist say it. Um, but just so you know where he's coming from, he has a very specific definition for whatever reason of what he considers addictive. And according to that definition, cocaine gambling is not addictive. According to like 99% of the other scientists definitions, though, uh, they definitely are. So that small minority that does get addicted is hit hard you are getting a little dose of gambling in your brain every three seconds. It's a gambling IV. And there's a drip, drip, drip. Doctors Robert Green and Henry Lasur are gambling addiction specialists at Rhode Island Hospital. They treated 1,300 slot addicts who, when they try to stop, 
look like heroin addicts in withdrawal. And they're coming in, and they could have quit literally. They're, they have shakes. Um, they're, they're really? Pulling, the, sh the cravings they're physically, are really, they're physically having these responses. And you tell yourself, it's got to be, uh, they've got to be on something. Yeah. And it turns out that they're withdrawing from the gambling. Right. Mr. Slots in particular. Yeah. And yet, state after state is turning to slots as an easy way to raise revenue and increase jobs. And no state has been more aggressive in luring gaming in the last few years than Pennsylvania, where the opening of the Sugar House in September made Philadelphia the largest U.S. city to house a casino. So far, there are 10 gambling halls in the state with nearly 27,000 slot machines. Former Governor Ed Rendell has championed the casinos. Well, gambling is not anything we should say, oh, thank Lord, we have gambling. But it is a decent way to raise revenue where the upsides that's produced is significantly better than any downside that comes from it. You said there were downsides to, to gaming. What are they? The biggest downside is that some people lose their paychecks. But understand, Leslie, we're, they're not losing their paychecks because Pennsylvania instituted gaming. Those people were losing their paychecks in Atlantic City, in Delaware, at the racetracks. So why not lose it West Virginia? Virginia? Well, if they're going to lose it anyway, let's get the upside. We were getting all the downside and none of the upside. The upside, he says, is the $1 billion the state got in gambling revenue last year, which was used to provide a $200 a home property tax reduction, plus more relief for senior citizens. People have been gambling since organized society was formed on the banks of the Tigris and the Euphrates. They were gambling. And they will gamble as long as there is life on this planet. And that's a fact. No one's saying that people can't gamble. This is about government using gambling to prey on human leaders for profit. Les Bernal is head of the national organization Stop Predatory Gambling. He and former Massachusetts State Senator Sue Tucker have been fighting a move to bring casinos and slot parlors to the Bay State. We're in the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. And the, the daily voice of government to most Americans is, we're going we're gonna to push casinos, we're going to push lottery tickets. Well, but you have a situation where states are desperate. They're way over budget. They have to find revenue somewhere. They know people will gamble as a revenue raiser. It defies every principle. It's regressive. In other words, it takes far more money out of lower income people's pockets than higher income. It is cannibalistic. In other words, it eats other forms of revenue. When you have your citizens dumping two billion down the slots, they're not buying a new car. And you lose that tax. You brought these casinos to the state. Do you ever just say to yourself, oh my God, I'm, there are a lot of people who are suffering, and they're taking whatever money they have, and they're Don't throwing listen. it away in these casinos. And do you ever just listen. say, oh, what no. have I done? Don't listen. Anyone who has that bent would be doing it in other places had Pennsylvania not legalized gambling. The counter-argument is that you're creating new gamblers. Then lots of you're new not gamblers. creating new gamblers. Well, because it's down the street. By, I mean, just logically. Of those people play the lottery. They bet they on the Super Bowl. How much money is bet on the Super Bowl? People are losing money for the state to get its revenue. They're Less losing than, money. Let me ask you, you have, I've always, I've known you for two or three decades. You're a very smart person. But not now. But you're not getting it. You're not getting it. Those people will lose that money anyway. Don't you understand? Our pressing him on this point led to this. You guys don't get that. I do get it. You're simpletons. You're idiots if you don't get that. We couldn't yeah. figure out why all the emotion. But his main point was that gambling is good entertainment and people should be allowed to make their own decisions about it. But since the first casino opened in Pennsylvania five years ago, calls to gambling addiction hotlines in the state have tripled. Sandy Hall says her problems didn't start till three casinos opened near her. I cannot read my local newspaper without having full page ads of upcoming events and slot play and free this and free that. Um, the exposure is phenomenal because of the proximity of three casinos. Fewer than 25% of Massachusetts residents went out of state to gamble. That's a lot of people. 75% didn't. I know, but That's the group the industry wants. They want the 75% that can get on the tee and go to a nearby casino and 
get in trouble with gambling. That's the playbook. All right, so you can see, and we will see how um, these uh, slot machines uh, are designed to increase people's putting the money in, pressing that button, and then, uh, just so we don't uh, uh, think that it's all used for doom and gloom, um, scientists, uh, when they were studying uh, the behaviorists, when they were studying these rats, when they were having them bar press, um, you know, and uh, training them to do that, they also did a lot of studies on stopping the bar press. So eventually, and you'll do the same thing with Sniffy, eventually they said, all right, well, what do we do if we don't want the, uh, the rat to bar press anymore? How can we get them to stop that particular behavior? And a lot of those principles, principles of learning, kind of like unlearning, they're used in treating people with uh, gambling addictions or other addictions. So a lot of these principles um, can be used to both induce a behavior and also later on to reduce that particular behavior. Any uh, questions or comments so far before we move on to the next example? All right. So one more example for today, just to kind of show you uh, the uh, powerful uh, human applications that you can have from animal experiments. So for this, we're going to uh, take a look at uh, one of the uh, very important studies by uh, Martin Seligman. So he wanted to know, uh, what was the effects of prior learning on subsequent learning? So if you learned something first, if you learned behavior A, will that help you later on learn behavior B? Or will that stop you later on for learning behavior B? Or does it have nothing to do with learning behavior B? So how does prior learning affect any learning that comes afterwards? So he put together a two-part experiment, one of the rare ones that used dogs. And uh, for the first part, for part one, he split groups of dogs into group A, group B, and group C. And then he would take individual dogs from that group and he would put them into a room. And that room had a floor that could deliver an electric shock. And that room also had a panel on the side of the, on one of the walls that the dog could press to turn off the electric shock. So that was a room, that was the way that it was made. And you would take dogs from group A and you would put them in that room. Let's say that each session was a half an hour. So he would put them in that room and they would receive no shock. So these dogs would just wander around the room, just kind of, they were the control condition. They would just wander around the room. No shocks were done, nothing was done to them. They were the control kind of condition in this experiment. So that's group A. Group B over here, they were placed in the room and they received shocks, but they were escapable shocks. So if these dogs pressed the panel that was on the side of the wall, they would turn off the shock that they were receiving. So at the beginning, what would happen is the, the floor would start to be shocked. Um, I can't remember the duration, but the floor would be shocked and the dogs would kind of be like, oh my gosh, what's going around? Uh, I don't know what's happening. And then later on, eventually the dogs would press the panel just randomly, just by accident, just because dogs you know, are also curious. So the dog would press the panel and the shock would turn off. And then that made the dog more likely to press the panel the next time the shock occurred. And that made the dog much more likely to press the panel the next time the shock occurred. And then eventually what would happen is they would just kind of camp out by that panel. And if they felt the shock, they'd be like, oop, off, oop, off, just turn off the shock. So they had escapable shock. When they felt the shock, they could uh, turn it off with the touch of a panel. Group C, uh, also received shocks, but they received what's known as inescapable shocks. So they could not turn off the shocks that they received. And what he did in order to make sure that these two groups received the same amount of shocks is he basically had two rooms, one where you could turn the shock off, one identical room where you could not turn off the shock. These guys would be placed in the room where you could turn the shock off. These guys would be placed in the one where you couldn't turn off the shock. And as soon as these guys press the panel, the shock in this room would get turned off. So that's very important to remember that these dogs, even though they couldn't escape from the shock, even though they couldn't do anything um, to uh, turn off the shock, they were in the exact 
they got the exact same amount of shock as these guys over here. So the only difference between these two groups is that these dogs performed an action, turned off the shock. These dogs could not perform any action to turn off their shock. All right, so in this case, the only learning that could have occurred here would be for this group over here. And as I mentioned before, this group of dogs learned to turn off the shock by pressing that panel and basically escaping from that um, uh, aversive stimulus. All right, any questions on part one? Yep. Yes, yes, so that's gonna come up in part two. So that's a good point. So again, and it's, it's, it's very important to uh, remember this, same amount of shock, but these ones, they did something and it turned off. These ones just got shocked and there was nothing that they could do about it. So that was part one of the experiment. What he did in part two was he took the same dogs that had been trained in that, uh, in that room in part one, and he put them in a new situation uh, called this uh, shuttle box. And what would happen in this case is that the dog would be on one side of the, uh, of the room and uh, there was no panel. So the panel was gone. You couldn't turn off the shock with the panel. And what would happen is a tone would start to play. And a certain time after that tone started to play, the floor on this side would start to shock the dog. And if the dog wanted to escape that shock, it would jump over to the other side where the floor wasn't being shocked. And then while it was chilling out on the other side, at some time the, the speaker would sound again. And this time it would have to jump back to the first floor in order to escape the shock. So in this case, the tone would warn the dog that a shock was coming and the dog could either escape the shock once the floor started to get shocked, or if he could, if the dog could learn that the tone signaled the shock, then it could completely avoid the shock, right? So it hears the tone and it says, oh, I got to get out of here. Let me jump over to the other side. Hey, guess what? No shock this time, you know, yay me. So that was a new situation. And importantly, that was a situation for every single group. Every single group of dogs from part one was placed into this situation. And every single group of dogs had the ability this time to jump over and uh, escape that shock. So what happened? Well, in, uh, in part two, the group that received no shock in part one, uh, they were able to learn to avoid the shock. So they eventually learned, oh, the tone is coming. I better jump over to the other side. Yay, I avoided the shock. They were able to learn that behavior. And in the end, they, were, they weren't getting shocked anymore because they were completely avoiding that shock. Group B, you might think that maybe the, uh, the panel press impeded their learning. You might think that, uh, I don't know the exact numbers on this, but I'm pretty, I would be pretty surprised if at the beginning they weren't looking for that panel going, where is that magic button I was pressing? However, they also were learn, uh, able to learn to escape that shock in part two. So they were also able to listen to the tone, jump to the other side, and they completely escaped the shock. However, as was brought up, Group C, their prior learning, the prior experience where they were in that room and they were shocked and they couldn't do anything about it, they couldn't escape it, that actually caused the majority of the dogs in that group to never learn to escape the shock. So when they were in that second situation, they would basically just kind of lie down on the floor, they would just take it for the duration of the shock, and they would whimper, and then at the end of it, they would be like, oh, well, this is my life, I guess. And then they would get shocked again. And importantly, the whole time, they could have jumped over that hurdle. The whole time, they could have learned that response and escaped from the shock, and uh, they just didn't. They just kind of gave up on even trying. So this was a huge result, hugely interesting uh, result. And um, this is what uh, the result that made this experiment famous because Seligman basically said that, uh, used this result to develop that uh, theory of learned helplessness. So that was the phrase that you were looking for, the theory of learned helplessness. So these dogs over here that could not escape the shock, they learned 
helplessness. They learned that they were ineffectual. They learned that they had no ability to change their, uh, their environment. And because of that, when they were placed in a position where they could change their outcome, where they could just jump over that, that hurdle, uh, they found themselves that they couldn't do it. So he developed this uh, theory of learned helplessness uh, from this study. And this theory has been applied to tons of human behavior. So uh, this theory really helped further uh, people's understandings of depression because uh, literally uh, this is almost the definition of what depression feels like. So if you've ever suffered from depression or if you've known people that are battling depression, they will not do things that people not battling depression do, right? So it gets kind of frustrating if you don't understand. You'll take a look at them and you'll say, look, all you got to do is get out of bed today. So simple. I might get emotional. I can't promise I won't cry. <laughs> Anyways, all you got to do is get out of bed today. So simple. Look, I got out of bed. You got out of bed. How about you? Get out of bed. Can't do it. Learned helplessness. Uh, you're in a job that you hate. All you got to do is quit. Your boss is a complete tyrant. Just quit. Find another job. This guy quit. He found another job. Can't do it. Staying in the same horrible job. Uh, people in abusive relationships, right? Sometimes you take a look at your friends or uh, people in an abusive relationship and you're like, why are you still with that person? Why are you still hanging around? Break up with them. It's simple. Tell them it's over. Break up with them. Get your, uh, you know, get your um, clothes out of their, uh, out of their apartment or whatever. Just, you know, end the relationship. I ended the relationship, you know, when my relationship wasn't working out. This person ended the relationship. Why can't you? Why can't you just tell them that it's over and go on with your life? So this learned helplessness helped to explain a lot of behavior that was very confusing to individuals, very confusing to scientists. Why don't they just do what other people find so easy to do? And again, this dog could jump over that hurdle. It had the ability, but there was just something about his previous learning that caused it to, uh, to not even try. So that led to um, a, a further understanding uh, of depression. It also helped identify a lot of behaviors that lead to depression. So one of the, uh, one of the big things that came out of this study was the effects of bullying. So bullying right now, uh, people back in, uh, um, I don't know how long ago, but bullying just used to be seen as a sort of, that's just what you got to go through. There's going to be bullies in your school. You know, maybe it'll toughen you up. Maybe it'll, you know, cause you to be uh, more assertive. All you got to do is just stand up to that bully. There was a lot of kind of acceptance of bullying because they just thought that's just kind of what it means to be a child. It's just part of what, you know, goes on in childhood. Because of this work, however, and it seems to take a while to discover in terms of bullying. But because of this work, this is why there are so many anti-bullying initiatives going on now, because people have identified bullying as a uh, as a situation that is very akin to part one in that experience. So children that are bullied, they are in this inescapable shock condition. Right. So they're in school. You got to go to school. Right. And then you have a bully. You got to give them your lunch money. You can't sit in that seat. Uh, they're going to beat you up, uh, you know, during recess. Teachers can't help you. Right. Because they can't be there all the time. So it's an inescapable situation. You can't stay home from school. Um, you know, it gets to be this inescapable shock, even more so now that, um, you know, social media is so prevalent. It's really kind of amplified that ability to bully. So, you know, before social media, at the end of the school day, at least you got to go home, right? And for the next 16 hours, at least you didn't have to interact with a bully. But with social media, you can be bullied 24 hours a day. Comments can come in on all your social feeds. Um, you know, things can be posted about you uh, 24 hours a day. So it's very easy to bully a lot these days. And that is formative years of these individuals' lives being placed in inescapable shock. And Seligman could have predicted this 
very easily. It's no wonder that one of the biggest predictors of depression is whether or not a person was bullied in the past. So that bullying in the past leads you to not learn the behaviors that can help you insulate yourself against depression. So again, if a person is bullied and then they get in a situation where their boss is horrible, their job is horrible, they've already learned there's nothing I can do about it. So I might as well just sit here at my desk and take it and I'll just try to live my life as best as I can, right? Uh, they're in an abusive relationship. Nothing I can do about it, right? It's just like it's always been. I have no control over my environment. Just going to sit here in this relationship, try to do the best that I can. And whereas everybody else can learn the behaviors that insulate them from these stressors that eventually cause depression, people that have been bullied, they're in this group C and they can't learn those new behaviors. So very importantly, this one study with dogs, okay, remember this is with dogs here, has led to immense increases in our understanding of both what depression entails, the development uh, of impression, uh, sorry, of depression, and then very, uh, uh, also very importantly, based on this research, Seligman actually founded uh, the uh, discipline of positive psychology. So positive psychology, I wish it had a better name because the first time I remember uh, hearing about positive psychology, I thought it was going to be all kind of like feel good, uh, self-help type uh, um, mumbo jumbo, you know, that you can find at any bookstore where people are peddling like, you know, uh, be the best self that you can be. Hey, well, you know, everything is great. Uh, you know, it's kind of like the Lego movie. Everything is awesome. Let's be positive. That's not what it is. It's actually a really uh, interesting field of psychology. It's pretty recent. And what he, what he did is he took a look at psychology and he said, everything about psychology, right, most of it is either studying a normal person or studying people that are having some sort of issues with their behaviors or with their cognition and getting them back to normal. Right. So it's almost like a medical model. Right. You only ever go to the doctor when you're sick. Right. Doctors only ever learn about how to take a sick individual and bring them back to a normal level of functioning. And that's what psychology was all about. It was how do we take these individuals that are struggling with these behaviors and how do we bring them back to a normal amount of uh, a normal uh, range of behavior? He said, you know, we can do more than that. And he said, let's not focus on this negative psychology, taking people back from a deficit, let's focus on positive psychology. Let's make them kind of like super able. Let's make them kind of like super resilient. So it's basically like psychology bodybuilding, right? You're going to take a normal person and you're going to make them like super buff psychologically. So if you have resilience, right? So in group C, not every dog failed to learn to jump over that, that hurdle. Some dogs learned to jump over the hurdle. Not every child that's bullied is going to become depressed. Some, not every dog, not every child that's bullied is going to become depressed. Some of them, you know, do not become depressed. So he started looking at, well, what is it about these people that makes them so resilient? And can we teach that to everybody else? Can we teach people to go from normal to like super resilient, to super cognition, to super uh, abilities? And that's what positive psychology uh, is all about. And again, this whole field came out of this one study, and he followed up with other studies, but this one study about dogs in a room getting shocked, will they jump over that hurdle or won't they? All right, so we're about to wrap up for today. Any questions, comments on, on this? All right, so before uh, we leave today, just want to uh, mention... Uh, one of the books uh, that I highly recommend, uh, if you ever feel that you're kind of struggling with learned helplessness, if you ever kind of think to yourself, I know what I should do, but I'm just not doing it, whether it's in a relationship, whether it's in your job, whether it's at school, one of the best books that I can recommend, and this is what my uh, cognitive behavioral therapy was based on when I got out of uh, depression, uh, Learned Optimism, How to Change Your Mind and Your Life. It's by Seligman. It's highly effective. It gives you step-by-step -step behaviors and strategies that you can do to break you out of that cycle, to break you out of that 
learned helplessness cycle. So again, I highly recommend it if you feel at all that there are things that you should be doing that other people are doing, but you're just not doing them. I highly recommend uh, Learned Optimism by Seligman. Other than that, we are done for today. So next class, just a couple of reminders, next class we're having our first quiz. So make sure that you read up on uh, chapter two. It's gonna be a pretest. Again, the uh, quiz questions are gonna be taken from the quick quiz um, questions at the end of every section. Not the ones at the end of the chapter, but the ones at the end of every section. That's where I'm gonna sample the questions for the quiz. And just to make sure that uh, uh, everybody is aware of this, I'm gonna uh, mention it two more times. Thursday, so a week from today, is gonna be the online class. Uh, I will post uh, the lecture uh, up online. I'll give you details about how to access that uh, next class, but we will not be physically meeting here. So Tuesday, show up. Thursday, do not show up to class. Nobody will be here, hopefully. Uh, I'll be in Toronto and you hopefully will be enjoying the lecture. Other than that, we are done for the day.